Okay, let's just imagine just for a moment that there is a rating system for how bad of a driver that you are. So for this example, let's just say you have a number between zero and 100. Zero being absolutely no risk. You're the best driver in the world. 100 being the worst driver in the world. We're talking you can't pull out of your driveway without getting into an accident. That type of driver. What I want you to do is tell me what you think your number would be. Zero being the best, 100 being the worst. Go. Okay, so the reason why I asked you about your numbers because this first story is exactly about that. It's a rating system for complete strangers and how much risk they are on the road. This new system is basically a dash cam that sits in people's vehicles. It's an AI powered uh, cloud crunching dash cam that uh, constantly takes videos and finds bad drivers. It takes these videos and it rates these you know, drivers by a number. I don't know what the actual scale is. I'm just going zero to 100 for the hell of it. But they've been testing this thing out and they've recorded 400,000 hours of driving. They've analyzed 300,000 road events and captured video in 2,000 different cities around the world. Now, this is kind of interesting because I'm kind of a aggressive driver. I want to say I'm a bad driver. I'm just I'm an aggressive driver. You know, I go a little bit over the speed limit. I maybe merge a little bit quicker than others. I may or may not weave in between traffic trying to get my ass to work on time. So, if I had to rate myself, I would probably say on a 0 to 100 scale, 78. It would be higher, except I don't really get into accidents. I mean, I did when I was a kid, but not anymore. Maybe 78 is a little bit too great. I'm going to go with 68. I'm going to say I'm on a 68 out of 100. What's your number? Let me know what you think. And also, what do you think about this kind of technology? Do you want this dash cam essentially recording everything that you do from random people's vehicles and giving you almost a credit score or a rating number to where people can just like pull it up on their screen and know ahead of time whether or not you're a bad driver? I mean, on one hand, it's like, hey, it's going to make the road safer. On the other hand, Hey, everyone knows I'm a dick. The second story is a little bit more techy on a computer side. Samsung is going to be releasing a one terabyte in, uh, NVMe drive, solid state M.2, pretty soon, and it is crazy. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because the one terabyte is up to 3,200 megabytes per second read speed. Write speeds being upwards of 1,800 megabytes per second. Insane speeds. My Revo drive, I can't remember what it is, but I think it's like 12 or 1800 read and like 1100 write or something like that. Oh no, it's been a long time. But the speeds on these drives are getting insane. And I've actually been waiting for a while to find a drive worthy of upgrading from my Revo drive because I know I really do need some more space. On one terabyte would be perfect. They're saying that this drive is probably going to cost about $500 for the one terabyte, which is also amazing. My Revo drive, I paid $850 for. Not even joking, $850 for. Now, it was kind of back when it was relatively new, so now it's probably a lot cheaper, but still pretty insane for the price. A price tag of $512 for a terabyte of speeds that are that quick. I mean, this thing dwarfs the 750 SD, so kind of interesting. Definitely something to look out for. I think I'm actually going to jump on that band. Maybe not this year. Maybe not this year. Maybe next year after vacation and after I pay off my new four-wheeler I just bought. Next up we have a digital fingerprint system for cameras. Now this is really, I did not even know that this existed. This is complete news to me. Apparently, when you take an image, when you take a photo of something, the lens that you have has small imperfections that essentially give a, a footprint or a fingerprint on that image. Now they're very small pixels that are either out of the, uh, moved in the wrong direction or twisted somehow or whatever. Whatever the logistics is, it's just little pixels are off, but they're always off in the same exact manner, right? So if you're constantly taking photos with, let's say a Nikon, every photo you take on a, like a, a microscopic scale is gonna have the same fingerprint as every other photo. Now this new technology that they're doing is basically a new system that will use less 
horsepower, less computing power, in order to find these digital fingerprints on images. Now originally they're kind of saying, hey, this is going to help allow people to uh, track down image thieves, people who steal you know, content off the internet or try to sell it themselves, or they have disputes on who owns what, that sort of thing. But also, and the reason why I actually kind of like this, because this is nice, they have a way to catch criminals who take things like pornography pictures of children, right? So this makes a way to where any kind of an, a photograph that's taken and thrown on the web, whether it's on the dark web or however that's done, um, as long as the camera's f fingerprint is registered, which I don't know what that entitles, but let's say if it is registered, then they will be able to match that up, that child pornography or whatever criminal you know, uh, photography is being done with that person's phone. That's interesting. That's cool. And in a court case, they can use that against them to prove them guilty. Also interesting. Now, they will need to register, from what they're saying, they will need to actually register that fingerprint. Now, you might ask yourself, why the hell would you register that fingerprint if you're that sort of a person? But if you have a nice camera, like let's say this Nikon, I don't know anything about Nikons, but let's just say this is a super nice camera and it costs $5,000. And you want to make sure that if anybody ever steals that camera, that you can recover it or prove that it's yours, right? So you register your fingerprint just by taking a picture, sending it into the database, they analyze it, they say, okay, your fingerprint ID is such and such and this is your camera. Perfect, you're registered. That's not just for Nikons either. These are for cell phones too. Any, any kind of uh, camera that actually has a sensor on it, which is every freaking camera, you can technically register this fingerprint with them. So if you do that, you register your fingerprint in case of it being stolen or your photographer being stolen, et cetera, or whatever, then they have it on file. You just gave them your fingerprint. If you ever do anything wrong, you upload a photo that's not good, for whatever reason, they could track it down. Or if they go to your house, bust down your door, and they find stuff, they could prove that it was taken with your camera that you purchased with your credit card because of this. Pretty interesting. For this next segment, I actually wanted to cover this, I think, a week or two ago, but I, for some reason, forgot. This is actually, this is a new cancer study for aminotherapy. Now, this might actually be kind of like a universal cure for cancer, potentially, because rather than fighting the cancer, they're actually using the person who has cancer's immune system. They're genetically modifying the cells to make the body fight off the cancer themselves. Now, I'll link to this uh, article in the description so you can check that out and read a little bit more on it, but they have done some tests with it. Um, they actually gave humans a minor dose of this, of something that wouldn't affect them. Oh, it does kind of make them sick too. Yeah, whatever. I'd rather have the, the flu or the cold for five weeks rather than die of cancer, but it does make them sick. So they gave low doses of the vaccine to a few different uh, human trials, and they actually had some really good results from it. So I can't wait to see this developed more, see if this is the wonder drug that it could possibly be. But this kind of uh, attack towards cancer is pretty interesting. And on to more computers, China has officially announced a new top dog for supercomputers. I won't bore you with all the specs, but I'll give you a few of them. Basically, this new one has 10.65 million cores spread, up, spread throughout 41 thousand separate chips that's insane which is like what 265 cores per chip anyways wow this can't be right and it, basically it, it's insanely fast and it dwarfs almost by three times the one before that and what's even more interesting is that the the united states actually put a ban on us helping china create and develop a faster supercomputer than what we had because we wanted the title so this is all china made all china products no help from the usa just all china help so that's pretty interesting they're saying it's the equivalent of 50,000 playstation 4s or 2.6 million Samsung Galaxy S6s. Whatever. Uh, let's see, and just real quick, the last step, the new machine can perform 93 petaflops, aka 93 quadrillion operations per second. Pretty insane. Supercomputers are super useful. I mean, they use them to, to make drugs and solve problems and develop new technology, so they're very useful. It's not just a record-setting thing, because that would not make sense money-wise, but they are definitely useful so it's cool to see this kind of technology take off like that, or I guess the same technology be developed like this to have these super insane computer speeds. And I guarantee you it can run Crisis at least 30 frames per second. 
Scientists have successfully converted waste plastic into fuel. Now, I will also, again, link this in the description because there is a little bit of a read to it, but what they're doing is they're just taking generic plastic that's floating in the ocean and they can break it down to, to a base chemical combine it with another chemical and do something else and actually come up with an energy that is actually less pollutant than the original fossil fuels used to make plastics. Now, I've seen some studies like this before, so this isn't exactly anything new, but this, this particular method where they're breaking it down using other chemicals is new. Not really a whole lot to say about it other than, aside from the problem of having to collect all the trash, this could be something that we could do with the existing trash we have all over our oceans, which you can see from this little thing. I mean, it is just everywhere around the oceans. Trash in the oceans is a huge problem, and it's like it's like one of those things that's just, it gets worse and worse and worse every freaking day, and we don't have a solution for it yet. We have a lot of things in the work, in the works, but no real solution as of yet. So, if we can get this put in place, get a good collection method, etc., and so on, maybe we can start cleaning that shit up. Who knows? And now to talk about Microsoft. Now, every time I talk about Microsoft, usually pertaining to Windows 10, it's filled with hate, and that's because a lot of reasons. But now Microsoft has actually started to do something just a little bit better. So props to Microsoft, you know, give me a little right there. So they're creating a tool for Windows 10 that allows people to seamlessly download and reinstall Windows 10, eradicating any bloatware that came with the operating system. So if you have things like Lenovo's or Dell's or Gateways or Alienware, shit, I don't even know which ones are out there anymore, HP, if you have any of those and they come pre-installed with bloatware, this would be a perfect utility for you to reinitialize your computer, reinstall everything fresh, and not really go through very much hassle, or I think you don't even lose anything either, it just removes all the bloatware. So definitely a really, really great tool for the less technically inclined individuals in this world. Yeah. Okay, last but not least, this is kind of just a little eh, a little side note, something I thought was cool. I actually don't use Firefox personally as a daily driver. However, this new feature, if you are into multiple logins for websites, is something called opening a container tab with the new Firefox beta. Now, this is actually through, uh, it's called Firefox Nightly, I think. Yeah, so Firefox Nightly. And as long as you get the newest version, the 5 point, or the 50.0 A1, you essentially have the ability to open up almost like a, a, you can open up like a private window, right? And it starts a whole new login thing. Like if you go to a face, if you go to Facebook, try to log in, it won't remember who you are. That sort of thing. So you can technically log into two different accounts with a browser, any browser, just by using the main one and the private window, right? So what this does is it just creates a separate instance and a separate tab that you can move back and forth from. And I haven't really thoroughly tested this out yet, but I have downloaded it, I just haven't played with it. But you can open them up and have separate sessions for each one. And when I was briefly messing around with it, it looked like you could have four or five different sessions. Now you might ask yourself why you need this, or why you think this is cool. Well, if you manage multiple logins for things like Twitter accounts, or I don't know, maybe you have different YouTube accounts, or Facebook accounts for different things, whatever, whatever your thing is, it doesn't, whatever. This is going to be your tool to allow you to easily go to each one and have each one individually separated without having multiple windows or multiple browsers opened up at one time. Makes your life easier if you are put in that uh, specific situation. So anyways, kind of cool. Again, we'll link that in the description. If you find that useful, you can definitely go check that out. Well, that's it for today, guys. Thank you for watching. I appreciate every single one of you. I'm pushing 20,000 subscribers and I can feel it. It's just... Mm, it's just right there. I can taste it. It's amazing. So I thank every single one of you for subscribing. I really do. Um, I've really been getting into this YouTube thing and just really enjoying what I do. You guys have supported me along the way, aside from the few haters. So I just want to say thank you for being a subscriber. If you're not already, consider subscribing below. Uh, make sure to like this video, of course, and have a great day.